Hi, Jasmine. Hi, Tim. It's so nice to see you. I know, it's been a little minute. I don't think I've seen you since my 40th. That's three weeks ago. Yeah, and I know everyone that listens think we do this every single week, but we don't. we're working a lot, so we pre-recorded lots of episodes. Yeah, so obviously we both work in retail full time and invariably we don't get weekends off as you guys know or in fact many days off <laughs> so what we do is we tend to block re record the episodes when you hear us talking about things like glastonbury festival in <laughs> september <laughs> it's because we've block recorded the episode and it was when glastonbury was happening so we actually haven't been in the studio together since june crazy yeah and it was a heat wave and now it feels so nice and cool in here and I haven't seen you since my 40th. We were meant to record a couple of weeks ago, but I was so ill after my 40th birthday that I've only just recovered. And Tim thought it was gonna be super sexy to have one of those husky voices on, on camera and I had to be like, no, no one's gonna hear a word you're saying. A few of the customers uh, where I'm working said I had a sexy voice. Yeah, I know. I heard you on FaceTime because I would FaceTime Tim. He'll be at work. And someone sent me a message comparing me to Barry White. It was working for me. <laughs> so what else is new? Well... <sighs> Last time we spoke, you had left. I'd left retail and thanks to everyone who reached out on socials <laughs> to wish me well in my new career. that I finally left the shop floor. But I have news, Jasmine. I know the news, but not everybody does. Um, so Jasmine and I were working together in a store in central London. I left at the end of July to try and pursue a career in the degree that I did. Um, I think you can say the degree. I did a degree in politics. And I've been, I took the time out because I wanted the headspace. You know, our job was so busy. Yeah. I worked in like an event pop-up space. It's crazy busy in the summer with a crazy activation yeah. that we won't talk about. <laughs> um, so I needed the headspace to apply for roles, interview. Um, so that was at the end of July. We're now, what, beginning of November. So that's what, August, September, three months ago. Uh, I haven't found meaningful employment. <laughs> so I'm back on the shop floor, guys. It's, hap it's happened. So where are you? You know, what's the sort of vibe of the shop? What's, is it just you on your so, own? Are you with other people? A lot on my own. It's an amazing store. It's basically an interior design firm. I've worked there in the past, on and off for like the last seven years between mm -hmm. studying, before studying. Um, and the store is just authentic. It has a lot of integrity. We sell amazing like interior pieces. What's an authentic store? Aren't they all just selling? It's not, <sighs> it's not trying to sell a vision of like, we're a green company or yeah. we have a story or we're, we're a heritage brand. It kind of is all of those things, Yeah. but with authenticity. You know, the store's 60 years old. Oh, wow. Yeah. So and nearly as old as you. Almost, <laughs> almost as old as me. Um, yeah, and, you know, buys ethically, sustainably, supports local designers. Yeah, that's um, good. The owner is an interior designer, also does big interior projects for residential and hotels. So it's, it's, it's nice in, this, in the way that, yes, it's retail, but I'm kind of also involved in the creative side, which, which has been fun. I love how you're in the creative side. I'm the creative and you've already got a more creative job. <laughs> I like to think I'm a creative too, Jasmine. You are a creative soul, back in the day. So today we're talking about the job market and, <sighs> you know, with a little bit of a focus on the graduate job market. For those that are new to the podcast, hello, thanks for following us. Yeah, we need all the follows, likes, subscribes, whatever those little buttons are that yeah, are our things. Yeah, guys, this <laughs> is quite a serious call to action Because now. that's how we can actually keep doing it. Otherwise, we're working long days, long hours. It's really it's hard to... It's not just that. I think let's be honest about the situation. <laughs> we're both working retail for a low wage. The next week's episode is about kind of the, the cost of renting in London, but it's, it's outrageous now. 
our salaries haven't increased in line with the increase in rental costs and everything else in the cost of living crisis. So we are obviously financing the podcast ourselves. And so on top of everything else, we're also paying for the studio to record the podcast. Yeah. So we are broke. We're broke. <laughs> but we love what we do. So a like and a subscribe on YouTube or a follow on socials and a review on Spotify or Audible or Apple Podcasts makes a massive difference we'd love you we love you guys (laughs) we want to monetize this podcast because yeah and we want to get everyone on like we want it to be a place where we it's not just our stories we want it to be where other people can start speaking out we want to be able to build it and actually when i say we want to monetize it we want to be able to spend at least one or two days a week so we can cut down working retail to like part time yeah so we can really dedicate some time to to growing growing the shop floor and getting guests on for next season. We want guests. We do want guests. <laughs> I'm kind of getting bored of hearing my own voice, never mind yours. I was bored of yours a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so setting the scene, just going back to what I'm saying, gra- uh, Jasmine and I graduated at the same time. We started at uni in September 2019. Yeah. I went to Cambridge and studied politics. I went to Central St. Martins and studied communication design. We studied during the pandemic, which for anyone else that did, or actually just living through the pandemic. Oh my God, disgusting. It was hell. I loved lockdown, but I hate the fact that I've come out and like all these jobs are like, we want 10 years experience. And it's like, well, where where was I getting that in lockdown? You know what I mean? Yeah, I'd say. Can we think so back? <laughs> in at Cambridge, there's a massive pressure on the student students to do uh, work experience. Right. Uh, in the Easter holidays, they call it spring break. So spring break work experience and then summer work experience. So basically, you're setting yourself up for a job when you graduate. So basically, finding one of your mum and dad's friends to work with. Yeah, <laughs> nepotism basically. <laughs> at Cambridge, oh, mummy's um, friend. But I don't have any of those contacts. Um, and because of COVID, none of us were doing the work experience. I mean, a few people were doing kind of uh, virtual work experience. Virtual? Yeah. So remote, remote working. But I didn't. I actually just got my head down and kind of focused on doing the degree. I actually didn't have the headspace to be able to do a degree at Cambridge, which is hell, and do you know, a work placement as well. I was so kind of in the zone. I thought they don't want you to work. I thought that's the deal. You can't work during term time, but outside of term time, they want you to be doing okay. to be doing an internship. I did none of those things. What about you? <laughs> so, well, at school work experience, so we had to do all that stuff, but it was kind of more like a chore. No, but at uni, were they I kind know. of setting you up for, okay, Never. this is what you're gonna do. This is you... a nightmare. This was why it was terrible. It was like, I lived in La La Land at university. Like, this is what it'd be like in the real world. It was not like that in the real world. Like, I 100% wish I'd had a sandwich year, something to really understand what it was gonna be I like. Love a sandwich. Yeah, mm, tasty. <laughs> But like we had no sandwich. I mean, we didn't even have a a meal. (laughs) And I think that I wish now, looking back, like those skills that you learn in those internships, and they made it really difficult for people to go and even have a year out. Yeah. Like I know people that did, and they 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 still were like, you know, are you sure? Are you sure you want to do this? It's like that was the best thing they could have done. Yeah. So obviously, we both graduated. We both got the grades that we wanted to get. Congratulations, Jasmine. Um. And then we went straight back onto working on the shop floor whilst I thought it would be a short stint, a few months while I'm firing off applications. I mean, Tim was like, I'll be gone at Christmas. Christmas had gone. I'm like, Tim, are you still there? Yes, I'm still there. <laughs> then every Christmas was your deadline. You never met that deadline. No. It's impossible to though. So we rolled on a year, July. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's, I think that was also the, the thing that pushed me out of retail is that enough. And I kept hearing my brother would said it actually, and a few others, you know, once a year's passed since you graduated, prospective employers might start to question like, how come he didn't find a, a role mm. within a year of graduating? You're scary. What's me wrong? Now. What's wrong with this guy? No, don't say that. <laughs> I'm scared for myself now. So. That was, yes, that was July. And now it's 16 months since I've 
been applying for graduate jobs without success. Right. Well, I had like, when I came out of uni, I went away traveling. I'd saved up from working and I was like, oh, I need to have some headspace, like you said. I was like, oh, it won't be so hard. Surely not, because I had loads of friends that were getting jobs. And then I came back and I realized, oh my God, it actually is. And like, because I'm not, I think some people are really organized and they look at like job descriptions the whole time they're at uni and they were making sure they were doing things that sort of built those skills. I did not think about any of that. I think that's, you know, the job market is shifting so quickly. Like, why shouldn't a young graduate be able to graduate and be like, I'm going to take some time out and travel as you did mm. and still be confident that when you return, you didn't go for long. No, not at all. And also the scary thing is, is like, you can't even use that now as a skill. You can't be like, you know, I did solo traveling by myself for three months in a whole other country, whatever. It's not Before, even it's not even impressive to people now. They're just like lazy. You're lazy. Yeah. And also there are we've we've met them, you know, there are kind of my peers at uni that are so driven. I lack that. I'm driven, but I lack that. I also want to chill. You know, they they did go straight into a job because they set everything up. They made all the contacts. They yeah. did everything that they needed to do. And I didn't do those things and I'm still in retail. That's the problem because I'm like, I want to live in the moment, enjoy my time at uni. I never really prepped for these. The, but to the real ease world. our conscience somewhat, uh, Bloomberg recently reported that graduates preparing to leave UK universities are facing the toughest job market in years with fewer spots available and wages for those posts lagging behind a jump in the cost of living. Um, also data from Reed Recruitment, one of the UK's largest employment platforms, also shows that the number of positions available and, mark and marked suitable for graduates is about 40% below 2018 levels and pay for those posts has declined steadily over the last 18 months. I mean... So it's not It's our fault. dire. And I feel so bad for like our generation, not... Not because we're like, you know, all the snowflake stuff, people moan about us, you know. Well, we're not the same generation, so <laughs> I won't lump you in. Yeah. But it genuinely is hard. Like, the world is so fucked at the moment. And not only that, we can't even get a normal day-to-day -day life job to support ourselves. I, I totally understand why there, why there is fatigue, why people are like, oh, why, why bother? Like, you know. Yeah. Why am I even bothering to, like... Yeah, I mean, and that's with the emergence of kind of quiet quitting and things like that, yeah. which, you know, I don't think anyone would have dreamt of before. But like you said, it's the pressure on people now, you know, if you're renting or even with a mortgage, you know, interest rates have gone up so much. The cost of living, everyone is under constant stress. And to be able to kind of think, oh, I'm going to change careers or I'm going to, you know, it takes a lot of work to actually be job hunting, you know, actively searching for roles. Like, where is the time to do that? I know, you've gained three more wrinkles in the last five months just from that. I had this injected away a few days ago. <laughs> um, but I mean, the job market is evolving, you know, th we th th just think about things like uh, automation and technology. Yeah. Well, I think, I don't know if it's the same for like the sort of industry you want to go into, but like for mine especially, there's so many different softwares they want you to use. They want you to be like able to use any computer software. You think, right, well, I do you want me to specialize or generalize? And how can you generalize to that extent? And then they're also going, you know, entry level job, but we want three years experience. Where were those three years in my life? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing kind of automation happening in our industry, you know, on the shop floor, in retail. We spoke in a previous episode how I went into Harrods and they had a self-service checkout. Seems like a basic example, but in the Tesco in Notting Hill that I go to now has one cashier and they're all the self-service checkouts. None of them take cash. You can only spend, use cash at one till. Like there are barely any staff in that store anymore. It's such a nightmare for me. Do you ever get it when you, I'm always like getting booze or something and I don't know why I go to the self-service and then I realize no one's there to help me. So I've just stood with the red light flashing. Yeah, just looking it's around. It's like, like, oh, he's gonna ID me now. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, automation is also happening kind of warehouse jobs. So, you know, uh, e-com fulfillment warehouses. Yeah. That's all happening. 
Um, I was with my mate in Northampton. We saw this robot driving down the street. I've it seen was, that. It was delivering someone. I saw it in Cambridge. I, I saw it in Cambridge, and it was like it was actually ter- it was kind of apocalyptic. How's I? I feel he, there's no need for humans. Isn't it called like the Badger or something? I it's know. like a little box. <laughs> yeah, that's and along it has the, a little like flag on the top. To little watch antenna. Her. <laughs> I thought it was quite cute. It's hilarious. But it's I called do- an antenna, isn't it? So I don't know. Once my my little sister was going to a birthday party, a fancy dress birthday birthday party, and my twin sister was in the car. We were dropping her off, and my twin sister saw someone going to the party as a bee, and she said, and she had uh, antennae like tentacles. She said, "Oh look, she's got a pair of testicles on her head." <laughs> I think she meant I think antennae. She, yeah, <laughs> easy to mistake. <laughs> but yeah, automation it's happening. It's happening. But if you have experience in AI, yeah, your background, your degree is in... Yeah, well, visual communication. I think that's a slight... I think it's a massive worry. A bit like you're seeing with seeing with films and like sag at the moment. So the big... Uh, the um, Like, you know, who... Why would you bother making a commercial if you can just generate it? So the it? strikes, the actors' strikes you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, but it's similar because there, there are obviously the problem with AI and also... They, they're getting royalties and stuff like all the streaming services are sort of not yeah. useful but it's the same even in like the design art and design it's like you won't need someone to make stuff anymore if you've got robots and you can actually get AI to train to do the ideation process you can train it so it comes up with ideas for you you don't even need to brainstorm yeah. it will present you all these ideas yeah. and you I mean, go yeah on the most basic level I've got friends that work in recruitment that are automating elements of their own job through AI, so they're like it's a, it's becoming a passive income. Their employer doesn't know. To be but, honest, I don't. I probably would prefer speaking to a robot than a recruiter. But employers <laughs> will catch on to that soon, and then we'll won't see the need to have the employees. You know, at the moment, yeah. employees are able to weaponize AI and use it to kind of do to, their CVs, yeah, all that. You yeah, know. like. Um, but AI will take over those jobs eventually. Imagine AI on the shop floor with us. Well, it's happening. We ha- at your birthday. We had your friend who graduated from St. Martin's. Oh uh, yeah. We can't my AI say friend. too much, but she is also creative. Went to St. Martin's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But has experience in AI and is working on a big project for a major international retailer with a focus on uh shopping experience that's yeah. grounded in ai technology crazy no i forgot that conversation yeah it is mad we were sworn to secrecy and so actually I... when i speak to her she does say some things and i get worried about like the future of jobs in general like i'm like do i even bother going into like such a traditional job if that's just going to be wiped out i just want to be the ai controller yeah and i think particularly with ai you know with the demise of department stores, and we're saying that now landlords can't can't fill these huge units. Yeah. And that's obviously still a problem. Still, some are kind of reducing the size of the footprint to make multiple retail spaces. Yeah. But with the r- r- rise of AI technology in retail, actually in physical retail spaces, often it does away with the need for a physical inventory. So a, a customer, you or I, can come into a store, look at a product that's AI generated, see it situated almost physically within the retail space, then see it situated within our home, and then it's we order it and it's sent straight to our house. So actually retail spaces probably will become smaller and smaller and smaller. It's crazy. I mean, I'm still amazed by that box in Uniqlo where you just throw your clothes in and it seems to know what's in there. Never mind all this. Yeah. It's a bit like the Amazon Fresh where you just walk out with I know, the shopping. I love it. You feel like shoplifting. I've only been once, but it was But like, again, where wow. does that leave people like us, you know, that our experience is on the shop floor in retail? We need retail jobs. Also, I guess my fear is that, you know, you can't actually stand up now for what you think is right for an employer and how they should treat you and pay and all these b- benefits that you want to receive and flexibility with your role. Then they're just going to go, well, we can replace you. You know, they've got this leverage of we can just replace you. You're replaceable. And beyond the point of like, oh, we'll have to hire someone. Because AI, you train it to be the thing you want. So it's not like they're going to have to have a nightmare hiring new people and get them onboarded. Because AI will just, no. It's like. Yeah, I think following on just from what you said, The Guardian reported the same thing. They 
said that gone are the days of this power shift that happened during the pandemic between yeah. employer and employee, where, you know, employees were able to start saying, actually, we want to continue working remotely, or we want flexible working, or I we, we want a sabbatical, for example. Now with the kind of economy stagnating, that the power I think has shifted back to the employer. I saw this too, and I saw loads of companies who had these incredible perks, a lot of tech companies started cutting down on them and they're suddenly like, no, we free, won't do in-house laundry. In-house I mean, laundry. I who has that I mean, anyway? That but was like, Facebook, no, yeah, Meta. Yeah. Um, things like the free lunches have disappeared. Uh, gym memberships. So one of them was like they had a well-being retreat that you could go to. Yeah, and that, I, mean, that they I mean, this all sounds very extravagant, but this starts at that level. Imagine it at even just like a base level where your your benefits are just having half an hour lunch paid, yeah, right? Like it, it goes back to what we were saying in a previous episode, where employees can be like, "We need you to do this. You're just lucky to have a job. Yeah, you know? we and need if, you to do this <laughs> extra half hour to set up the sale for Boxing Day. Yeah, you know." Like you're lucky to have the, this and, job and, and, and the actually we'll climate. just hire a robot next time. <laughs> It'll be in more, much easier and they'll kick up less of a fuss. Yeah, it's scary. It's really scary. But I mean, let's talk about the gap be between the skills that graduates come out of university with and the skills that prospective employers are actually looking for. Um, well, I think that's the problem. I mean, I came out of my degree and I still didn't think I... Are you questioning that? <laughs> no, I didn't question the degree I did because I really enjoyed it. But I don't, I wasn't, didn't have kind of very definite skills that would instantly put me on a path to a career. Yeah. It's quite a broad, I'm, I've come out as, with a generalist kind of degree in the social sciences. It's hard, isn't it? Because I think so many jobs now want these hard skills. Like I've been saying, I will be applying for entry level roles, asking for retiree level skills, you know, of someone who's worked so many years. And a lot of them, a lot of it's hard skills. But they say they want hard skills, but they say that young people are also lacking soft, soft skills. skills. <laughs> like we just can't win. Yeah, because if you sit in your bedroom all day learning different softwares or learning programs, then you're not going to be out talking to people. And then if you're out talking to people, you can say, well, I don't know all those softwares. And it's like, oh. Yeah, so uh, one report said that 34% of corporations and 44% of academic institutions felt that graduates were lacking the necessary soft skills to work in the workplace. So what we're talking about, communication, teamwork, problem solving, uh, leadership, uh, openness to criticism, snowflakes aren't equipped apparently. What do you say to that, Jasmine, as a snowflake? generation <laughs> <laughs> as a snowflake my gosh i think it's really difficult i think it's incomparable the world we live in right now because we are as a generation exposed to so many different things and i've always thought this like when i think about my grandparents they lived in a, a, an echo chamber of everyone was working a similar kind of hours day that all their lives were similar where you lived in a si similar area that was their who they compared themselves against. As for my generation, you see this whole world, like your school canteen is now the whole world, right? That you're comparing yourself to. And you see the issues with it. And it's it's almost overwhelming to think what job, because there's these jobs popping up all the time that we've never even heard of. How do you know what skills you need for that? The education system is so yeah. behind that it, how is it ever going to catch up with the rate that we're evolving? Right. And like, yeah. so of course we're not going to have. I any think what employers and people doing this ridiculous studies fail to realize is the emotional toll that it's t that searching for a job is taking particularly on young people. Yeah. But on everyone, everyone across the kind of jobs market, it's very demoralizing. I think as well, like the self-esteem that takes your self-esteem takes such a huge battering when you're getting like, I had a week where I'd, every single day I had a rejection letter. I mean, you and I, let's be honest. I, you know, I have struggled with my mental health through the years. And I think particularly in the last 18 months as I've tried to find meaningful employment in the fields I want to go in. And like you just said, facing multiple rejections a week, 
And these are for entry level roles, often for internships, often unpaid and still, you know, opening your email in the morning, and getting those rejections. Yeah. And you you start to think, what is wrong with me? You know, why can't I even secure an interview for this role? And you also think like, I spent three years dedicating my life to a degree. I spent that money I wanted to invest in myself and it's not paid off. And yeah. It's not paid off and it's- it You is, played the game. Yeah, and you think I played the game and I'm still losing. And honestly, like you said, I've found this has been the hardest year of my life by far because I'm out of a system that I would've been in for whatever, 23 years. And you're suddenly into this world that is just constantly rejecting who you are. Yeah. And just also what you've done, it's like how much more, and we also work incredibly hard. I would yeah, say we I have mean, really tried to. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was gonna say. I mean, don't get me wrong. I know that I was incredibly privileged to go to Cambridge, but I also worked so hard. You know, I went back to college, did an access course, cause I didn't have the, you know, the, the suitable A-levels. Mm -hmm. I, I worked incredibly hard with a view in my mind that when I graduated, doors would open. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, certainly they do socially, but I think in terms of finding a job, it hasn't happened. What areas have you been looking at then? Oh my God, everything. I think they get to a point where you're just so desperate to have that validation, you'd apply for anything. Like I was applying for roles and my mum was going, are you sure you'd want it to be like, community arts helper or whatever and my mum's cool. like i know <laughs> but like for me that's never anything i wanted to do so i started to just apply for everything you but really like, have to diversify literally when i say the jobs i've been applying for is like studio coordinators i mean just just studio being skivvy i think is the, is the correct title <laughs> literally i mean the job description is like we only require to basically be able to move objects in the room you know and be organized and it's yeah. like they're not asking for a lot but what I've realized is the competition is so strong because if you've got me who is entry level going, oh yeah, I'd love to do it. I can do all this. And then you've got someone else who's so experienced in other stuff. You're gonna opt for them because they'll bring mm. more value to your business because you'll actually, and what employees are doing now, and it's frustrating me, is they're giving people who are overqualified for the job, the, the role, because they are getting free, like they're getting free like help with their business. Free like labor. I, you know, we work with people who are well above the ro role level and they are going above and beyond in the role. They're not compensated for it. They're not paid for it. And the employer knows this. He goes, well, if I can get someone who's far more skilled into this lower skilled role, yeah. I can rinse them of their skills. Yeah, I think that's happened certainly in places I've worked. I think employers see the breadth of my experience and utilize that to their advantage, but still pay me a poor salary. Yeah, I was look, thinking about this actually on the way this morning about the stagnation of salaries. In 2006, I got a job managing the flagship Patrick Cox store yeah. on Sloan Street. And my salary was 31,000. And then... What's uh, that in today's? So, wait. Yeah. So, I was thinking, so that's 2006, that's what, 17 years ago. Then after that, I moved on to a role in Manchester, salary 31,000. Then in 2010, I moved on to Christian Louboutin in Selfridges, salary 31,000. And then the job that I just left working with you, so this is 17 years later, when you think about the increases in everything, you know, cost of living, yeah. rental, everything. I was on 31,000. 17 years later. Is that like your angel number? But It's crazy, I mean, it's obviously something to do with me. I need to break, I need to, it's a, a mental block. I need to kind of break through, but it shows that employers haven't been committed to increasing salaries no. in line with inflation and the increases in the cost of living. It's really scary. Yeah, that's beyond wild to me mm. because I wonder what 31,000 today would have been back then and what 31,000 Well, I'll then. tell you what it looked like. It was me at the age of, I can't remember how old I was, 23, 24, shopping in Louis Vuitton on my lunch break. Harvey Nicks, I had a nice lifestyle. My, my rent was, we're gonna talk about renting yeah. next week, but my I lived in Hackney and my rent was 350 pounds a month. No. I was rolling in it. London was still pretty cheap and also luxury brands 
weren't what they are today. You know, the price increases in these brands are so nuts, but you could go into Louis Vuitton, pick up a bag for 400 quid. And I did, you know? My God. I was having the best time. But those days have gone. And now I feel sad. Mm. <laughs> and yeah, and I feel like I'm missing out. I mean, out. that's why, you know, with our age gap, you know, I feel, you know, sad for young people that they can't go to uni and even post uni still just have a great time. Do you know what's... Socialising, partying, going out to dinner, holidays. <laughs> I'll the never forget my aunt and uncle saying the same thing when they graduated and they came to London and they were working in London, their first ever you know, jobs postgraduate. And they said they never, like, they didn't, they weren't like living like kings, but they never forego anything. They never like, were, like for me, I would definitely be like, oh, I'm not sure I'll have a meal deal mm -hmm. at lunch because yeah. I can't afford to do that. They said, oh no, that would never have been a question. You'd, you'd never worry about that kind of thing. You'd still live. You might not eat at the Ritz or whatever, that kind of ridiculousness. Well, but you, you weren't foregoing simple you know, when you, necessities. You know, when you read or hear about those Daily Mail narratives of the youth of today need to just have one less flat white and they'll be able to afford a property. <laughs> You're like, are these people okay? Like my, my parents, you know, were able to have five kids. You know, we had a holiday once a year, we had a car they bought a house. They didn't have high paid jobs. My, you know, my dad was a college lecturer. My mum worked part time. There wasn't a lot of money rolling around. No. But I think most people were able to afford a certain standard of, of living and could certainly think, I'd like to have a child. We'd like to have a kid. Yeah, that's not even a thought on my mind. And for young people now, that dream has been blown I mean, out of the water. You can barely afford to even go on a holiday every few years if you're lucky. Like at my age, the thought of when, when I look at children, I'm like, God, money bomb. All I see is a big bag of money rolling around in a pram. Yeah, I mean, the last <laughs> holiday I had abroad was in my second year of uni. So that's what. Came, yeah, I remember what, you went away oh, with yourself. Yeah, to Croatia. Yeah. So two and a half years ago. It, it's, it's actually insane. And I, I just compared to my mum and dad, their whole, the way they could afford to live was just completely different.